The decorator pattern allows us to modify the behavior of an object without that object even knowing about it. And last time we saw how the strategy pattern can be used to swap out the internals of an object's behavior, but a decorator changes the object's behavior from the outside. So in today's video, we'll first examine some code that would benefit from the decorator pattern, and then we'll apply that pattern using the traditional class structure from the original design patterns book. And then finally, we'll modernize the code with some of Kotlin's language features. So to start with, let's look at some code for a simple logging system and consider what problems it might run into over time. So here we've got a class that can log a message to the console, and it has a few different features that you can turn on and off. So for example, if we want the date and time included on the log line, then we can set this property to true. Or if we want a unique identifier added to the log entry, then we can set this one to true. And we've got another one for including the name of the thread that's running this code. So to use this logger, we can just instantiate it and call log, as you see we're doing down here. And if a feature is enabled, then that feature appears in the log output. Otherwise, if we disable the feature and we run it again, then it doesn't show up. Now, even though we've only added three features here, we can already tell that this class is struggling a bit. And as we add more and more features to our logger, our constructor is just going to keep growing and growing. Another problem that we have here is that we've got this clock parameter, which is really only relevant if we want to include the date and time. But as this class is currently designed, even if we don't want to include the date and time, we're still going to have to provide that clock. And then finally, we can see that this class is hard coded to the destination of the log message. So in other words, print and print line send the message to the console, but if we ever wanted to send this log directly to a file or send it to a remote service somewhere, we'd have a little bit of work to do. So the decorator pattern could be a good fit here because it would allow us to pull each of these features out of the logger class, but still allow us to customize the logger's behavior. A decorator works by wrapping another object, but by keeping its same interface. Now, so far, we've just got a class. We don't have any interface, so let's add one. To start with, let's rename this logger class to console logger. And that clears up the namespace so that we can use the name logger for our interface. So let's write our interface next. And our console logger class is going to be able to now use that interface. And of course, we'll need to add the override keyword here. And next, we're going to pull out each of the individual logging features and make each one itself a logger. So to make that a little easier, let's introduce an abstract class called logger decorator. And the only thing this is going to do for us is to hold on to an instance of an underlying logger. And I've got some thoughts about this class, so I'll circle back to this in just a minute. Uh, for now, we're ready to implement each of the features as a logger. So let's start with the unique ID feature. We'll create a class that extends logger decorator. And we'll accept an underlying logger as a constructor argument so that we can just pass it along to the superclass. Then, of course, we'll need to override the log function. And this function is just going to call the log function on the underlying logger instance. But instead of simply passing the message verbatim, we'll prepend a random UUID to the message. And now that we've got the UUID feature in its own class, we can remove it from the original console logger class. Great. OK, next, let's do the same thing for the thread name feature. We'll just create a class for including the thread name extending logging decorator. And this time we'll add the name of the thread to the message. So it's the same basic idea as last time, but this time we're going to add some content to the end of the message. And naturally we could put it at the beginning if we want, but I'm putting it at the end just to demonstrate the options that we have. And with this, we can remove the feature from the original class. 
And now all we've got left is the date and time functionality. And this one's going to be just a little more involved because it has that dependency on a clock object. But that's not really all that hard. We can just add an extra constructor parameter and make it a property so that we can use it inside the log function. So this follows a very similar pattern to the other two decorators. And now we can remove the date time feature from the original console logger. And that includes both of the remaining constructor arguments and the line in the log function. And when we do this, we're really left with a very simple class. Like all it does is print the message to the console and add a new line. And in fact, we can consolidate this into a single print line call. So here we've got a decorator pattern as described in the original Gang of Four design patterns book. At its simplest, we can just instantiate a console logger like this. And if we run this, we'll see our message is printed out in the console verbatim. But we can easily add the timestamp to the message by wrapping console logger in a call to the date time logger like this. And now when we run it, we'll see a timestamp on the left hand side. And we can do the same thing for the thread name logger. And of course, we can also add the unique ID logger. And when we run this, we'll see the same output format as we saw in our original logger code. So this gives us a classic decorator pattern. The design patterns book gives names to the different types that are participating in this pattern. So the logger interface here is known as the component. The console logger is a concrete component. The logger decorator, this abstract class here, is a decorator, of course. And each of the subclasses of logger decorator is a concrete decorator. Now, I included the logger decorator in this example only to fully implement the decorator pattern according to the structure in the original design patterns book. In our code, since all it really does is just add a single property, it doesn't really add much value. So I'm inclined to just remove it entirely and just have each concrete decorator simply implement the logger interface directly. So we've successfully separated the logging features from the code that's actually writing the logs. And with this structure, if we ever need to add a new feature, we can do that without ever touching the console logger class. Or if we need to log our message directly to a file instead of to the console, we could easily introduce a new file logger class without ever touching the decorators. And they'd be able to work with the new file logger without any changes. So with this code, we're in pretty good shape. But even though this is Kotlin code, it feels more like traditional object-oriented languages that rely on classes for everything. So let's not stop here. Let's see what we can do to make it more expressive in Kotlin. As we saw in the last video, if we have an interface with a single function in it, like our logger interface here, then we can make it a functional interface by adding the fun keyword to it. And once we do this, we can implement that type with just a lambda after the name of the interface. So for example, instead of using a class for the logger, we can accomplish the same thing like this. Now keep in mind that it here refers to the message parameter. So if you prefer, you could name it the same as in the interface, and that might provide a little more clarity. But personally, I prefer using the implicit it parameter, so I'm going to put that back. This single line is much more expressive than the class that we were using before. It does the same thing as the class, but when expressed this way, we don't have to give it a type name. And we don't need to add all the usual syntax for overriding a function. We just give it the function body, and we're good to go. So it's concise without being terse. Now, after doing this for the console logger class, we can do something similar for each of the concrete decorators. We can create an extension function that will decorate a logger function with the added feature. So to start with, let's replace our unique ID logger class with an extension function. The receiver type for this extension function is logger, and it will return a new logger instance. And that's going to allow us to use a fluent style when creating our logger. We'll just call through to the underlying log function, giving it our new message. 
I named this with unique ID so that it will read well at the call site, and you'll see what I mean in just a minute. Notice that when we call log here, that's calling through to the receiver object. And just like with our console logger object, the dollar sign it here refers to the message parameter. Okay, let's make the same change to the thread name logger. Easy enough. And then as before, the date time feature has just a little more interest to it since it depends on a clock object, but that's not that big a deal. We can just add it as a parameter for this function like this. And we can use the clock object exactly as we would expect we could. And with these changes, we can now update our call site. So no need for all the nested constructors. We can just refer to our console logger and then call each of our extension functions where each one effectively wraps the previous logging function. So now we can run our code and we'll see the same basic log structure as we had before. So we've replaced all those classes with just an object and a few functions. And by doing that, we've eliminated a lot of the verbose syntax that comes along with classes and replaced them with much more concise functions. And that helps to keep our attention on the things that are unique about each function. Now, if we wanted to take this further, we could replace the functional interface with a type alias so that a logger could be any function that accepts a string and returns a unit. But I'm pretty happy with the functional interface on this one, so I'm going to leave it like it is. So there we go. By using functional interfaces and extension functions, we're able to capture the essence of the decorator pattern and give it a more modern expression that works well in Kotlin. Now, before we wrap up this video, I want to let you know that we are planning the next episode of the Type Alias Show live stream. At the time that I'm recording this video, I'm still working on setting the date for it. But once I've got the date locked down, I will announce it on social media platforms. But the best way that you can stay looped in on those plans is to sign up for my email newsletter. And that way you'll be among the first to know about the schedule for the next live stream. Plus, you'll get the inside scoop on everything else that I'm working on. You can sign up at newsletter.typealias.com. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today, and I will see you next time.